final speaker for this afternoon's session is Dr. David, um, Mr. David Speller. Sorry. Uh, 2017, David set up OptiFarm, uh, which is believed to be the world's first 24-7 poultry monitoring centre, where clients' poultry farms and facilities are monitored and optimised around the clock, and this is on a global basis. I would now like to invite David over to give his presentation on applying precision livestock farming to poultry production. Thanks, David. Thank you for that. Um, I'll try and be a doctor one day. Yeah, that's right. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to take you on a little bit of a roller coaster for, for 20 minutes or so, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to soften you in gently to start with with some pretty straightforward stuff. And then by the end, I'm expecting you all to look at me like I've caught too much of your wonderful Australian sun and I've gone completely bonkers and uh, this silly Englishman's mad. That is on purpose, okay, because I want you to try and leave this by thinking, actually, there is no limits to where this could go, and some of it's kind of out of our control as well, and it's just going to come at us. So, first of all, just who am I? Very quick summary. Uh, I'm a broiler chicken farmer, okay, based in the UK. Uh, my business looks after half a dozen farms within the UK for investors predominantly. They'll come to me and say, we want to build a farm four or five million Australian dollars, but we don't want to farm it. We actually don't like chickens. We just want to make some money from it. Um, so we get the dirty end of the stick and we have to do the farming. So, so we're a farming company um, and then we do quite a bit of innovation and trials because I'm a bloke, I like gadgets, I like toys. And if you call it innovation and research, someone else pays for the toys and sends them to you to play with. So that's kind of pretty cool. Um, and then really what I've done is tried to supplement the income of the farming business, which is under pressure, by diversifying effectively into consultancy and, and monitoring, and, and that's where this, this concept of OptiFarm came about. And for about two years we've been controlling a farm here in Australia, in, in Tamworth, I'm going to visit it tomorrow, and that'll be the first time I've visited it. I've controlled the lights, the feeders, the environment for two years, massively improved that business, and I've never visited it yet. So that's the sort of business that, that we're involved in. And we do a bit of logistics and, you know, we'll do anything for money. Um, just to give you a scale of, of, of what we are, you know, we're not massive. I employ about 30-odd people. I got up to about 50 or 60 at one point. A lot of them were lorry drivers and uh, pressure washer operators. And uh, thankfully, I don't have them anymore. So we've, we've scaled back a bit and uh, we're about 30 people. So we're not massive. Um, got about a million and a half birds on the floor at any one time. Um, in the UK, we kill 20 million birds a week, so um, we're not that big, you know, we're less than 1% of, of the UK market. But that gives you an idea, and then OptiFarms around the world, um, and we're probably overseeing about 35 million birds a year being produced at the moment, um, and, and growing pretty, pretty quickly. And the aim really is to, to value add to my business with this, this precision livestock bit. But I just want to set the tone really and just say to you, you know, canned food, Right, I, I nicked this slide off someone, I thought it was brilliant, and I've used it ever since. Yeah, they invented canned food in 1810. Brilliant. What a great technology. How long do you reckon it took to invent a can opener? <laughs> 48 years. <laughs> so for 48 years, man thought a hammer and chisel was the best way into a tin. Until someone invented the can opener, and hey presto, we look back now and go, what were we doing for 48 years? And I kind of feel that precision farming and precision livestock farming is a little bit like that. Until we get in there and find out the answers, we kind of don't know whether we're doing a good job or not. We might think we are, but we don't know. But I think that's great. 48 years, my word. And another little scenario, just to set the scene, is you know, imagine yourselves not being livestock farmers, those of you in the room that are livestock farmers, and imagine that you had a bakery making bread. And really, you know, what are you going to do at the end of the day? Sorry, the formatting's not 100%, but you know, do you turn everything off and go home? So you're going to turn your ovens off and go home, probably, if you're making bread. I would suggest you can't do that with your livestock. At best, you can turn the lights out and let them have a sleep, but you're doing well to kill them and then wake them up in the morning. <laughs> so the reality is we can't do that. Do we get a night shift in there to look after our animals? Well, there are some places in the world we visit and they do have night shift, although... I would suggest some of those night shift staff are not really doing much more than keeping a check on the gate being locked. Um, but, you know, they do exist. But for my business, it's not financially viable to have night shift. And actually, I can't find any beggar to work during the day, never mind to work at night as well. So that is kind of not going to work either. So the next thing is, 
given if you had a bakery, are you just going to leave your ovens on? Bit of bread in the oven and come back in the morning and see what the heck happened? That's kind of what we're doing with our animals. We're going home, we're going to bed, we've got to get some sleep, and then we're waking up in the morning, going back to our factory and going, how would you get on overnight without me? Everything all right? I don't know of another sector that would do that. It's bonkers. But it's kind of what we've all grown up doing. So that's kind of just setting the scene, really, of you know, where we are and, and, and what we're doing. So it kind of baffles me a little bit that for a third of the life of my chickens... I was in bed sleeping, letting them get on with it, and they're probably out in sports cars and living the dream, and we've all seen the film Chicken Run. God knows what they're up to. So we had to try and amend that, and, and for me, precision livestock farming was an opportunity to be able to do something about that. So if we look at you know, just some of the stuff we've got installed, we've got some dynamic cameras, which is a technology looking down on our birds, and I'll show you a graph in a minute of something we learned from that, and that's sort of looking at how much the birds are moving around and where they are in the barn. We have auto scales and they're great because they'll tell me how much they're growing. But what's really interesting with them as well is it'll start to give me an idea of activity aside from dynamics because the number of birds jumping on and off those scales tells me how active they are. And also we can look at uniformity and there's lots of things we get from the scales. Feed and water registration. You know, we were one of the first to start weighing the feed into our sheds 10, 12 years ago. People just did water. But actually once you've got food and water you can then look at the ratio of the two which then gives me an indication of the gut health, and there's all sorts of extra things we get. We were one of the first to put closed circuit TV into our barns. Everyone thought I was bonkers, but actually, you know, it, it's pretty standard now around Europe that you would build a chicken farm and you'd put CCTV in there and you'd watch your birds. And the first thing I learned was actually this concept again of leaving the birds for a third of their time. I would often go to work at 7 a.m. and wind the tape back to 2 in the morning to see what they were doing while I was in bed. Or there's another moment in a chicken shed, the minute the lights come back on after a dark period, you can see exactly where your drafts and cold spots are. Because when the lights are out and the birds sit down, they very quickly move away from cold, drafty areas. And so it's a really easy way to see. Because once you're up and walking around, it's not so easy. We have microphones in there. Um, and this work continues. What I would say with microphones in a chicken barn is when 60,000 of them are all shouting at you at once, it gets a little bit confusing. So we're having to use directional microphones and new technology to zoom in on just one chicken. Otherwise, there's just too much babble going on. One says it's cold, one says it's hot. Well, now what do I do? <laughs> and then lots of environmental stuff. You know, we were the first to put CO2 sensors in 10 years ago, 2,500 Australian dollars. People thought I was bonkers. Nowadays, 600 Australian dollars or so, and every barn has one in. It's pretty standard. So a lot of this stuff that we started putting in came about from me just saying, why, why, why? I don't understand why. Why, why, why? And I needed the answers. And over time, it becomes normal. So a couple of graphs, just looking at some of the stuff we've done. This is some dynamic data for a chicken barn. And this was really interesting because what you've got here is five days' worth of data, and it's looking at activity. And you can see these chickens are a little bit like me. First thing in the morning, they're quite active, and they feel quite good about themselves. And by the afternoon, about this sort of time of day, if I don't have plenty of coffee, I start getting a little bit lazy and I'm ready for a Spanish siesta. <coughs> so, fine, what does that mean? Well, what it means is that my feeders and drinkers are after tremendous pressure early in the mornings. And by the time I get to work at 7 a.m., the peak of that demand on my feed and watering system is over. So my assessment of my birds is after their peak demand. And yet in the afternoon, they're not fully utilising the drinkers and feeders because a lot of them are quite lethargic. So what we were able to do was to show that by manipulating lighting patterns, we could completely break up this diurnal rhythm and get a complete flatline activity throughout the 24-hour period. And so we, we use some of this data now when we design new farms to now give more drinker space, more feeder space, all for that period early in the morning because otherwise we were making the wrong assessments during the day. Water is another one. I say I'm not going to go through loads of them, but water is a really easy one. All right? If there's one thing I'd say, you know, water is a great thing. And it can tell us a huge amount. And I've listed some of them there. I'm not going to go through all of them. But again, one of the most common things I use my water information for is not actually how much they're drinking or how much they're growing, which I could do. I use it in hot countries to tell me when my clients are overcooling their birds. People have a tendency in hot countries to bang on fans. 
and bang on your fans at 9am because it will keep the shed cool so that by 2pm when it's really warm my sheds are cool. And I can watch my chickens happily drinking away until that farm manager bangs his fans on and the whole shed will dip about 20% in water consumption straight away. They're too cold. So they go and sit down and think, crikey, and they turn into the wind, so the wind's going straight on their feathers, and they stop their drinking. And we can use that water data to actually advise people on how to bring the fans on, when to bring the fans on, and whether they're overcooled or, or heat stressed. So you can use it for lots of different things. And this is just one graph I'm going to show you of chicken consumption in a broiler shed. And this is 15-minute consumption data, how much they've consumed over the 15 minutes. And there's a few things I can get from this. So the first thing is I can check that they're having a dark period. And you'll be amazed how many of my clients tell me that they put their birds to sleep for four or six hours a day and they carry on drinking 24 hours a day. Well, that's a bloody miracle if you can get a chicken to drink in the pitch dark. It's not true. So we use something as simple as that to prove that the birds are resting. And it is a good thing to let them rest. All right, It helps with the skeleton growth. It helps for them to digest all of their feed systems. It, it really does work for them. Not too much, not too little but some dark is good. So we can see the dark period, it's really, really easy. I can also see this peak demand, and I can see after a dark period, my birds have a big demand. So again, I'm back checking, will my, will my flow rates keep up with that? Are my pressures correct? Will my pumps keep up with that? But another interesting thing in there is I can tell you when the stockman went in that barn. Because when you walk into a barn, the birds stop and they have a little look at you. And when they do that, they're not drinking. And we use that data in Eastern Europe to prove that no staff went to a farm on a Sunday. <laughs> they were paid to, and they told their boss they went, but I can assure you nobody went in those barns on a Sunday. So we can get a lot from water about the stock people as well as the birds. But our experiences, if I touch on some of our experiences that, that you can learn from some of this PLF, is the more innovative these ideas are, the more problems you're going to have. All right? It's not rocket science, but it's the truth. All right? the, the most flashy, gizmo, lovely, sexy bit of kit I've had on my farms has probably had three times more attention from an engineer than some of the more simplistic stuff. That doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means you've got to be prepared for that. This often isn't kit that we put in barns and forget about, certainly not in the early stages. The other thing I'd say to you is be fully prepared to end up asking yourself more questions than giving yourself answers. Because you delve into a world that you don't understand and you start going, well, that's strange. I didn't expect that to happen. And then you go off on a journey looking for more answers. But it will continually raise questions. The other thing is the data, it's just numbers. All right, it doesn't actually give you any answers. The best that we get from a lot of kit is, is sort of red, amber, green indications, and they're brilliant at disseminating numbers for my, me and my staff. But don't tell me what to do. Your water has dipped a little bit, and here's an orange warning. Brilliant. I like that. Now what? I don't know. I just tell you that the water's dipped. Right, I've got to do something now, and that's quite tricky. You know, what do you do? There's so many multifactorial issues going on. What do you do? The other thing we've learned, again, not rocket science, but you've got to get your basics right as well. You can have all the sexy PLF in the world, but you've got to make sure that your regular farming practices are still solid and good. Nothing changes there. And of course, you know, no great surprise, but it really has dawned on us that agriculture is pretty slow to accept some of these new ideas. Some of the stuff I'm going to touch on in the next few slides is absolute commonplace in other industries, and yet we within agriculture often go, really? They go, yeah, really. And that's just who we are. You know, that's, that's the sector. And it amazes me, you know, it doesn't matter what language you speak, which culture, which country I visit, we're all the same. So has it paid for me? That's always a question, does it pay? Here's a graph. Red line is the group average gross margin into our factory. Blue line would be ours. And you can see that generally the blue line, us, we were always doing better than the red line. And you can see there's a point there that I've marked when I really went mad on PLF. All right, I got carried away. Some of that was with EU money. That always helps. But uh, there was a period I went mad. But it was a little bit unclear whether we were making any money at that point from this investment. So what I did was I broke it out and said, well, where were we 
in actual pence above or below the average at those moments. And there was a very clear step change in the average when we put the precision livestock farming bit in there. And we were asked to put numbers on it, and over the, the project of the EU funded, we reckon in your Australian dollars, that one farm made an extra 370,000 Australian dollars. But there would have been an investment of probably around 100,000 Australian dollars in kit. And that doesn't include the time then to analyse the data and make the decisions and make sure the actions happened. So there is some cost to that. But the other thing I would take from that graph is that actually we saw some, some spikes and dips. And you can see that not every round was brilliant. PLF allowed me to capitalise on those good birds when the genetics and the health of those birds were good and the feed was good. But if I went through a period where feed and nutrition was challenging because global prices were very high, or there was an issue at the hatchery and my chicks weren't very good, PLF wasn't going to save the day. I could only maximise the potential of each individual flock. But overall, it did pay. So some of the tips I'd give to you. All right, initially, only spend on stuff that you want to know. All right, sorry for exhibitors and sponsors. That doesn't mean they're not going to buy anything off you. I'm just saying, buy what you're going to use and use it properly. All right, otherwise it's a bit like my smartphone probably does 10 times more than I can do with it. Ensure you look at the data and make some decisions on it. All right, and for us, we now do that 24 hours a day because we've made a business model out of it. But you won't be able to do that at the start for yourselves. But do take on board that if you're making that investment, you've now got to put some time aside or employ somebody or a service to help you get something out of it. Don't be put off by the initial spend. It doesn't have to be massive. All right? You don't have to go and blow uh, your life savings on the first project you want to do. But expect that you're going on a journey. When you start and you spend those first few thousand dollars on something, you're then going to go back and you're going to spend again and again and again, I'm afraid. It's a journey you're going to go on. And some of the stuff I'm going to highlight now will show you how far away we are in our PLF on farm now to where we could be and where others are going to take us. So our vision as a company is firstly about improving animal welfare. All right, It's been touched on already today. If I get the welfare of my birds right, then hey presto, they do better for me. All right. If I let off a, a firework above one of my farms, 200,000 chickens go, oh, isn't that a pretty firework? Well, they don't because there's a roof. They can't see it. But they hear the noise. That's 200,000 of them that have just turned round. If that took one calorie each, that's 200,000 calories. That's a heck of a lot of Mars bars. So I want to keep them absolutely calm and perfect. Don't burn energy keeping warm. Don't burn energy keeping cold. Don't even walk too far if you don't have to. Just keep yourself in a perfect situation. As a chicken's perspective, and I'll touch on this in a bit, it's about what the chicken wants. Not always what some retailer comes to me and says they want because they're a human and they've decided they know chickens. You've got to improve performance by better meeting the needs of the animal. And I just touched on this. And for me personally, I'm not a scientist as such, I'm a farmer. But I like to try and relate to animals, and I like to try and understand what my animals want, and I like to go into a barn and see what the chicken is telling me. And PLF for me is starting to give me more and more and more information, particularly some of the new stuff coming, where I really understand what a chicken's thinking. You know, we should get with these microphones where I am Dr. Doolittle and I can translate chicken talk. And that one says he's hot, and that one says he's thirsty, and that one says he's hungry, and I can deal with that, because I'll deploy a load of robots and they'll go and look after them. It's all possible. We want to respond in real time. Okay, I, I don't have a big issue with big data. However, my problem is that we do eight harvests a year of our broilers, and the genetic flocks are changing annually and they're actively selecting these flocks. So if I try and get big data going back three years, that three-year-old data is irrelevant to today's flock. So I want to do things in real time. I want now. I want this genetics, this food, this environment, this weather outside. I want it all in real time. And I want a, I want a business that can recruit people. No one in the UK wants to work seven days a week. No one. It doesn't matter how much you pay them. 
They might accept the job on 200,000 Australian dollars to start with, but once they've cleared their credit card bills and they've been on holiday and they've got a new car, very quickly, the money doesn't matter. They don't want seven days a week. So I've got to have a system using PLF that allows me to recruit people. And then as a business, we want to share some of that knowledge. So these are some of our aspirations from PLF. It's not all about driving performance of my broilers. It's a much bigger thing for us as a company. And we're always going to challenge what we know. What I know today and what I tell you today, by next year, I've probably got different ideas. I'm just going to keep challenging that. And it's fascinating. Earlier, I was talking with, with Tally, and we were talking about crocodiles. And I'm like, whoa, yeah, I wonder what a crocodile thinks. That's just who I am. So here's some interesting stuff being developed with us and, uh, and our innovation. The first one on there, volatile compound sensors. All right, it's been in the press for a number of years that someone's dog can sniff when they get cancer. What the dog is sniffing is the change in smell of that owner. We all give off a signature of various volatile compounds, and that changes when you go through a stressor or if you're becoming sick. And we're developing sensors now where we can not only detect the smell of a healthy chicken and the smell of one with a particular disease, but I can smell it going on the journey. I can smell it three days before any physical symptom in that bird to tell me that its odour is starting to change to such a point that I know in three days it's going to go down with something. So if I'm then going to use anything other than an antibiotic for sickness, such as probiotics, prebiotics, I can get in quick and try and react. So they're great. And they were developed for human health, tuberculosis. You were supposed to take those sensors, blow in a tube, and it will tell you if you've got tuberculosis. But we're using it in a chicken shed. We're also going to use those to monitor our farms when they're empty. PLF is all about monitoring animals. Well, what about the nine days when I'm washing, disinfecting, and setting up for my next lot of chicks? I want to go in there and have a little sniff around and see whether or not it's clean and hygienic. I do swabs at the minute, send them to the lab. It takes three days. It's too slow. So we're going to use those for those. Robots. We've got several versions of robots we're developing. Some of them hover over the birds, analyze the droppings, 10,000 images a day, and it recognizes 1,000 different types of dropping coming out of the back end of a chicken. I don't know whoever took the photo of 1,000 originally. <laughs> But it will tell you how much moisture is in there, what colour it is, what shape it is. And from that, we can then decide again, how's the health inside that chicken based on these droppings. But this robot's doing it real time, up and down, up and down on a monorail system. We're then also developing some that live amongst the birds and move around with the birds. Because then it's living as a bird. So then I can see exactly what the birds are seeing and I can feel what the birds are feeling. And we can get simple data from that, like if, if I'm a robot driving for a flock of birds, I can't drive over one that's lame. That would be a bit, yeah, the welfareists wouldn't like that. So you've got to stop and go around it. Well, that's fine, but I can raise an alarm on that. And if I have to stop and go around more than 20 in an hour, there's clearly a lameness issue here. You better come and have a look. But more than that, I can tell my stockman, there's 12 in there, and they're here, 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 and here. Please go find those 12 birds, and he'll go and find them. And in time, those robots will pick out the dead, put them in a little trolley, bring them to the door, and leave them there for me to have a look at when I get to work. But I've got to be down in amongst the birds for all of this. Sensors to analyse the bacteria in the droppings of the birds. Again, if I'm going to give probiotics, which one do I give? We're designing a sensor that you'll put a poo sample in, in real time at the farm. It'll shake it, whiz it, stir it up, and it'll tell me which bacteria is in there and how many of them. So I can then monitor the imbalance of the gut health of these birds and then give them a probiotic that's appropriate for what they need. We're getting humanised software that can act like a stockman. Sounds like ridiculous, doesn't it? You can't do that. <coughs> no, you can. I assure you, you can. But it takes a long while to do it. But for us to make a decision, so if I'm going to walk over here, I make a decision, how many steps, is it even, you know, can I make it, all of this sort of thing you can train a software platform to do all of that. So we're developing humanized software that will help us. And part of the reason I'll touch on this is because I can't employ stockmen. They're not about. Young people don't want to do it seven days a week. So I've got to try and get some of the clever stuff doing it. <coughs> and also some precision tools to help with my staff. Because that's the other thing. Again, move away from the birds. How do I help manage my staff? How do I give them guidance? How do I give them advice? How do I help them? And also the sustainability dashboard because the environmental credentials of what we're doing are important. So we want real-time sustainability credentials looking at energy usage, carbon footprints, all of this sort of stuff that we can give to a retailer or a consumer at any point. 
So the aim in creating value really is about predicting diseases and using less antibiotics but using alternatives, which is easier <coughs> said than done, as, as any of us farming in the room will know. We want to try and manage subgroups rather than these massive barns of 60,000 birds in one barn. I'll ask you a question. I mean, you're pig guys, and my knowledge of pigs is my stepfather having lorries, and I used to have to, as a kid, go under the decks and get them out as it all rained down on top of me. So I've got some experience. But I remember having pig boards, and if you didn't show them daylight, they didn't push. The minute you showed a crack of daylight, they were underneath and bowled me over, and that was that. A question that I'm asking the scientists is, will a chicken walk through a hologram of a brick wall? I don't know. So if I want to segregate 5,000 birds in a shed, do I just create a hologram of a brick wall and suddenly they'll go, oh, I can't walk through that, I'll stay here. Don't know, no one's ever done it. But we're going to have a go because that'd be fantastic. Because I don't have to wash a hologram, I don't have to get manual handling a hologram, I just cast a hologram. So we don't know. So there's all sorts of bonkers things that we're going to look at. Predictive modelling, and, and that helps our factory. Yep, we want to do all of that, but it's not the, it's not the sexy stuff, that. you know, It's not really making us a fortune. But this, this welfare thing, again, we want to keep driving forward welfare, and performance will come with it. The other thing we're doing a lot of is we're effectively renting out our facilities now. We have an income into the farming business by renting our facilities as commercial trials facilities. We have sufficient amount of PLF on our farms and reliable data capture that we can now rent our facilities out to vaccination companies, nutrition companies, whoever it is to come and do proper commercial trials. And that's a really important part of our business now is that we're getting return on that investment in that way. And centralised monitoring of multiple sites. Um, and we had a conversation with, with one of you in the audience at, at lunchtime saying, you know, the distance is here in Australia and it's difficult when you've got to fly here and fly there. With PLF, I've managed a farm in the UK that's here in Australia for two years. I've never visited it yet, but I know it made him a lot of money. So suddenly you can centralise things, which is much better. And also it's helping with staff recruitment, because now I don't need experienced staff all the time. Just come with a passion. Come with a passion and I'll take you on and we can take you wherever you want to go. I've not got to say you need five years experience first. Well, where do I get that? So it really is helping us there. And preventative maintenance has just dropped off there. But we can do, you know, we can pick up stuff failing before it fails, which is really useful. So, you know, our example, I'm not going to go through it all, but we touched on it in the introduction. You know, Optifarm for us is, again, a global service capitalising on our knowledge. And I have a team sat there now 24 hours a day. Sad guys just sat there in front of screens and screens and screens monitoring what's going on. But it's brilliant, you know, and it's being uptaken by some very big companies and, and veterinarians and people like this. Other stuff then, here we go, we're going on a couple of slides of bonkersness. So immersive technology and virtual reality, all right? Kids have had it on their gaming for, for plenty of time. If I want to assess a chicken farm, really I should get in a cubicle and I should have a 360 view of the barn. It should be blowing the air on me of the same temperature and humidity. It should create an electronic smell so I can smell what it smells like. Um, and then I can really make a decision. So virtual reality would be great. Augmented reality is the next thing then. This is the new buzzword that took me a while to get my head around what AR meant. But basically where I can see it for me would be that in my office in, in, uh, in the UK, on my desk, I could create a hologram of a chicken from one of my barns. And I could just wipe it and peel away the feathers artificially. And then I could see it and it's, it's confirmation of its carcass. I could then wipe it again and take the, the flesh and the skin off and see its skeleton and see its leg formation and how its bones are developing. I could then just sort of peel it like an orange artificially and look inside and see the formation of the intestines and the, the content of the gut, all done by data created from robotics and sensors fed into augmented reality that creates this artificial reality for me that helps me in my world make a decision. Sounds bonkers. It's already there. There's a university in the UK that does it with a cow in the lecture theatre to teach the students about beef farming. They create a hologram of a beef animal and they start peeling it back in, in reality, just in front of them. Put mobile sensors on robots. How hot is it in this room? It'll have a variability. I don't want to just put one sensor in here or two or three. I want it on a robot going round and round and round, telling me where it is everywhere. Biometric sensors. I want to know the state of mind of these animals. They manipulate the F1 car drivers by monitoring their heart rate, body temperature, and deducting from that the stress level of the driver. 
And they know that when the driver's too stressed, he's twitchy and he'll crash. And when he's relaxed, he gets a bit cocky and a bit swaggery and he'll crash. So they hold him in an optimal curve. And we all have individual stress curves. My chickens will have the same. So what they do with that racing car driver is when he looks a bit relaxed, they ring him up on the radio and go, just keep an eye on your front tire, will you? We think it's going flat. Ooh, okay. And when he's a bit twitchy, they go, calm down, it's fine, there's no one around you. Oh, okay, I can't. And they artificially manipulate him. We want to do the same with our chickens. I want a bit of stress, so you go and walk to the feeder. But I don't want too much stress that you're mithered and skitting around and having a little dance and wondering what's going on. Space technology seems bonkers. Space technology. What are if you can see through dust in space and tell me what Mars is made of, any chance you can look through the feathers of a bird that's five metres away? Yeah, probably. Cosmic rays they're talking about, that they can use cosmic rays to tell you the moisture deficit of soil because cosmic rays react to the moisture in the soil and depending on the moisture content of the soil, it depends on how it reacts. Well, can you use that to tell me how wet my bedding is? in my chicken barn, because that's quite key for me to maintain the bedding, to keep clean feet, to sell the clean feet to China. So yeah, we can probably do that. So we start looking at that. CCTV analysis, software. I've met a company that their software will tell you which tank is coming over which sand dune and what speed it's coming at you and whether it's the Americans or whether it's someone else. If you can do all of that, can you watch my chickens for me? Yeah, no problem. We can do that. We're going to get into a period where technology is not just giving us data and information, but it's going to do jobs for us. All right? And there's a statistic that by 2030, they reckon something like 90% of all these sort of familiar jobs we do will be done by automation. It's not far away, 2030. Internet of Things. All right? I've got a smartwatch on here. I think it was the Americans that learned they're not a good thing when you go jogging around a secret camp in the desert and suddenly the data lights up on a global map and you can see where they are. But you know, wearable technology is starting with sport, but then it goes out to everybody. And they reckon by 2020, if you consider your car, your washing machine, your computer and everything else, we'll each have 50 bits of kit that are linked to us as individuals. That's a heck of a lot of information. But we can also use it because I want to know the mental state of my staff when they enter a chicken barn. Because if you're relaxed and on top of the job and feeling calm, you act very differently with those animals to when you're late for a wedding and your wife's ringing you wondering where you are. You've already told you you've left and you haven't even got in the barn yet. So that state of mind of my staff starts to become quite important and I want to manage that. I'm sorry, David, but we're going to have to stop that one there. Um, okay. Because so, we've got another... Um yeah, no problem. There was, the there was a couple more of... Uh, but it gives you an idea of just how bonkers some of this can go, is that it's just another world coming at us. Thanks so much for that. But we do have time just for a couple of uh, quick questions as well um, from all the presenters today. So uh, probably a maximum of three questions. Yes. Thomas Barnhazy, uh, just a quick question to the last speaker in terms of um, human monitoring, you know, monitoring workers. I think it's a brilliant idea, but how you go about uh, issues of privacy, uh, you know, data, it's, it's a big issue, especially in Europe, I'm well aware. So uh, um, how do you get at those problems? Yeah. I think it's, um, it's well understood that monitoring your staff is, is potentially a breach of privacy and, and that's something we're going to have to watch. I think the reality is where we're going to go as a company, we will have to get our staff to be aware that that is happening. It will almost be like I consensually give you permission that whilst I'm working for you, that you are going to monitor me and some of that's for my own well-being. Some of it's to monitor them as lone workers, which we already do, to make sure they're safe. But it's going to have to be, you know, how long can you go on going, I'm too scared of invading your privacy, therefore I can't move forward as a business. There'll be a point we go, I'm sorry, I'm the employer. No different to asking you to wear a uniform. I'm asking you to wear this watch and I will be monitoring that watch. And if you don't want to, that's fine. But that isn't our, our job. So sorry, you can't come and work here. And I think that's the harsh reality of where we probably have to go. It's just about being open, isn't it? 
I would suggest. It's when people capture things you don't know about, it's more of a problem than when you know they're doing it. Big um, voice. Yeah, so we do quite a lot of work with schools in the UK because it's, it's local. So, you know, we've given them eggs and, and incubators and hatched them out. And, and, you know, we go and give presentations at school. Um, so it is, it is quite important. It's quite difficult, we find, that the parents normally stop the children's visiting. When we say we do a farm visit, the kids want to come. And often it's the parents that say, yeah, I'm not sure I want my child going to an intensive agricultural farm. You know, it's this, that and the other. Um, but... Certainly, any images or stories or anything we can share with you, we would be very happy to do. Time for one last question. Uh, this one's for Stephen. Um, how do you make your market accept that uh, continual uh, gain in weight on your uh, peaks? So you increase the weight, the carcass weight, again and again and again over the year. How do you make the market accept that? Well, there's a couple of things that have occurred that are major breakthroughs. First off is an integrator is able to come with more intensity to the retailer and has greater influence of the retailer. The second thing that's occurred is lots of deboning. And so the, the meat is more put into portion, per, uh, at one point they said the pork chop's too big to fit on the tray and said, well, we'll fix the pork chop to the size you want it. And you can cut that out of a 125-kilo uh, pig as easy as you can a 100-kilo pig. And you, just, you decide the portion control you want and you design that proportionally. And then the other thing was, is said if, if we're going to be a reliable supplier and a low-cost producer to you, We've got to increase carcass weights. And we can't continue to have the retailer be the reason why we're continually having financial failure. Hey, thank you for that. I'll just ask you again to um, join me in a round of applause for our presenters this afternoon. Thank you.